Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once again, it's a privilege to stand on this um, exalted altar. Thank you, Pastor Man, for the opportunity to speak to the people of God. And I do not take it casually. It's uh, sometimes, like yesterday, uh, I felt I was dreaming for a bit before I found my dear. Thank you for the privilege. And for all of us that had to make a trip, I just realized that uh, there is no place in the U.S. that is close. You need to do distance to get to where you need to be. And I know you paid the price to be here. And the Lord will look upon that price and make sure. <laughs> you, will, you will completely forget the price you paid to be here. Anymore. Thank you, sir, for the first session. Uh, I've always seen you in posters, but... Uh, Lift upon you today. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, we ask that you grant the utterance to bring your counsel in such simple, plain language as Jesus himself would have done if he were physically present teaching us. Grant us illumination, grant us access, and by all means, Enable us to encounter your reality. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Please, you may be seated. God bless you indeed. Hallelujah. Now, yesterday we began a teaching and we began to establish how that a cherubim in the heavens went rogue and he set up his own mountain of authority and because of the, the way the physical creation and the invisible creation were put together, Anything that happens in the heavenlies will find expression in the natural. The reason why there's war on earth is because there was war in heaven. Are you with me? When John began his guided tour through heaven in the book of Revelation, so what happened in the book of Revelation was that John was being ushered into the reality of heaven. If you study that book, if you study that book critically, are you with me? You will find 12 interactions between heaven and heaven. For instance, there is food in heaven. The reason why there's food on earth is because there's food in heaven. I know you don't believe me. <laughs> I say that to capture your attention, but it is biblical. I know you don't believe me. So let's go to the book of Psalms. Who is there in the book of Psalms? All right, are you there in Psalm 78? Psalm 78, beginning from verse 23. I just want you to, let's do Bible study for um, 45 minutes. For 45 minutes. In the book of Psalm 78, verse number 23, 
The Bible says, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the door, the doors of heaven, and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food, he sent them meat to the food. So you see, manna was angels' bread. An angel's bread was made available to humankind. Who can guess the implication of that menu on the people that partook of it? Are you still with me? Now, what I'm trying to do in, in the next 15 minutes is to, to bring you back from the shopping mall. Some of you, your mind is making an attempt to bring you back from the train station so that it, it, your spirit and your soul and your body will be present here. The Bible says that he gave man, humankind, the corn of heaven. And mortal men partook of angels' bread. And he sent them meat to the food. It was not the window he opened. It was the door of heaven. Uh, we don't have so much time to do some, to put some things in perspective. What is the difference between a window, a gate, and a door? But it was a door that he opened to grant them access to angels' bread. How many of you still remember Elijah? In the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, he was frustrated from ministry and he wanted to exit. And in his, in his frustration, he made some strange statements that made me meditate. One of the statements he made was that I am not better than my fathers. Uh, in that statement that he made, he submitted to a limitation that has been in the lineage of prophets for many generations. He was submitting to the reality of a certain kind of insufficiency. You still with me? When he manifested his frustration, he went to sleep under a juniper tree. And before he arrived, the juniper tree, he had dropped his servant in his village so that no one would be able to trace his location. And that juniper tree that he went to, to, to sleep under what is God's zone when he was a young man. I pray you will not have a better yesterday in your pursuit of God. That was where he labored in prayer until the prophetic spirit came upon him. And he had strayed so far away from that location until a time when he was confronted with national witchcraft. There is there, there's territorial witchcraft, there's family witchcraft, but the kind of witchcraft that came against Elijah was national witchcraft. And he seemed not to have what it takes to contend at that level. And he confessed the insufficiency that he was exposed to, which was in the likeness of what prophets before him had encountered when this kind of warfare was opened over them. When he went to sleep with this grief, an angel came from heaven and woke him up and said, rise and eat. Are you there? I don't know the names of your bakeries. Um, somebody help me. Corner Bakery. Huh? Well, it's exactly what you just said. <laughs> Are you there? So the bread the angel brought was not from Conecra Bakery. Well, whatever. It, it was the corn of heaven. It was angel's bread. That's the first time a man was woken up to eat without walking. He had not walked. He said, come and eat. He rose up. He ate. 
He went back to sleep. The angel came again with another ration. Rise up and eat. And when the angel had the opportunity to tell the prophet why he was feeding him, he said, I'm not doing this because of your hunger. In my own mind, I would have wanted you to die of hunger. But I'm feeding you because of your journey, not because of your hunger. He said, rise and eat because your journey is huh? too far. And the Bible says that this prophet rose and he ate and he walked in the strength of that bread. There was no food again for 40 days. He went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. So one of the evidences, are you still with me? One of the manifestations that took hold on him because he partook of angel's bread was that he walked and he was not weary. How many of you have read the book of Isaiah chapter 40? When the Bible says that, Has thou not known, has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth is never weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increaseth strength. For even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. Now stop it. They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. And the evidences of strength is that, first of all, they, they mount up with wings like eagles. Now, you see, a, a similar was used in that scripture. He said they will mount up with wings. They will not mount up with wings like men. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Men cannot mount up. But eagles, it is supernatural for a man to mount up with wings. But it is natural for an eagle to mount up. And what it therefore means is that if you have eaten of heaven's bread, you will be able to do the supernatural, natural, mount up with wings, like the way you will do it. Mounting up with wings for you is supernatural, but you will do it like the eagles. It means you will do the supernatural, natural. That's one evidence that you have eaten heaven's bread. Secondly, the Bible says that we walk and not be weary. It is natural to walk, but it's not natural to walk and not be weary. So it means that you will be able to do the natural, supernatural. That's the second evidence that I'm still trying to bring you from the bus station. We have not started the... <laughs> I'm just trying to prove to you that in heaven there is bread. And one of the interactions between earth and heaven is in the menu. Jesus was the one that said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It means God will can eat man's food so that man can learn how to eat God's food. You are not with me. In the book of Genesis chapter 18, God in the company of two angels decided to visit Abraham. And when he visited Abraham, Abraham Abraham happens to be high in hospitality. And when they came to his abode, he sent Sarah to make some food. And God, in the company of these angels, ate human food. Read it. And the reason why God ate human food is because he wants humans to eat his own food. In the book of Exodus chapter 11, Moses was given an opportunity. God invited him to the mountaintop in the company of Aaron. And when they came there, that was the first time God decided to allow human beings, look, human beings look upon his frame with human eyes. 
And when the meeting was concluded, they ate God's food on the mountain. They did not go with water bottle and with with um, with, with um, hamburgers. So he stands at the door and knocks. If any man hears his voice and opens the door, I will come in and do what? And eat with you so that you can eat with me. I don't have time to go into that matter, but I'm just trying to capture your attention by telling you that there's food in heaven. Jesus, when he rose from the dead with his glorified body, he ate the fish. He ate fish. In the book of um, Luke chapter 24. So with that glorified body. That glorified body is capable of eating. So when you resurrect, you will still be able to eat. Well, um, may the Lord give you understanding. You will notice that it, it, is, it was because of food that Adam lost our first opportunity. And there are many things that you can lose because of food, your commitment to food. You cannot stop food. You are likely to expose your children to spiritual havoc if you do not have the discipline to stay away from food and to grow your spirit such that your spirit now becomes the controlling influence of your estate. What the fall did to us is that it made the soul to be extra large. We went for shopping today and I saw one shirt. It was, I think it was designed for angels. That's the only way I can. That's the only way I can understand why such a shirt should be on display. The soul became extra large. And humankind began to live life from the resources of the soul. Hallelujah. Just because someone could not control his appetite. So one of the ways by which earth and heaven can interact is through food. If we go to the end of the book, the, end, the book of Revelation, you'll find a menu. Such foods that come from the tree of life. But I don't want to go into that. I just, I think I've gotten your, your attention. now. Another thing You know, I said that there were 12 points of civil civilization in heaven. One of them is food. Another one is rest. Because there was rest in heaven, that was why God established Sabbath on earth. I'm just trying to show you that earth was designed to be a mirror image of heaven. And anything that is obtainable in the heavenlies will find expression on the earth. So if we want to begin to contemplate our dominion mandate, we need to understand the estate that God had put in place to ensure that we walk this earth with dominion. Are you with me? Now let me show you a scripture, even though I don't want to read any scripture apart from the scripture that I brought to you tonight. I am compelled to read this one. Exodus, if you're there. Exodus chapter 31, verse 17. Please, if you have your Bible, turn. We are going deep this evening. We are traveling deep this evening. And I need to secure your attention before we begin to navigate. Verse 17 reads, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested 
and was refreshed. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel. So I need to tell you that there's an allocation of rest that is given to every spirit being, including God. And it's only demonic beings that do not have the allocation of rest. But the Bible says that when an unclean spirit is casted out of a man, he goes about in dry places seeking rest. Oh, they are not here. Let me leave you. Seeking rest. It's looking for rest. He needs rest, but he finds none. It is his failure to find rest that makes him consider his previous accommodation. Are you there? So in the book of Isaiah, he now gives us an insight. Gives us an insight on how you can find rest. Because in this world, the storms will come from the external environment and they the reason why Satan is going to bedevil you with storms is so that he can get your soul to begin to acknowledge those storms. When he gets your soul to begin to acknowledge those storms, you have yielded to the authority of the storm. And the moment you yield to the authority of the storms, it takes rest away from then you become a victim of anxiety. When you become a victim of anxiety, are you there? I'm new in the US, so I don't, I don't understand the life of an average person in the United States yet. I, I will improve by the next time I show up. But in Nigeria, one of the things that can be a serious challenge is housing and rent. The way I see all of you, you don't have any problem. Do I'm do I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's assume this is this speaker is equal to rent, right? So when the landlord begins to push on this guy, the reason for which his soul was overtaken by anxiety was because of this. Are you with me? And then anxiety takes over his soul. When he becomes a victim of anxiety, he now develops high blood pressure, which is the state. At the end of the day, you realize that it was not that was responsible for his high blood pressure. It was not the house rent. It was anxiety. But anxiety used this excuse to hop into the man's life. Took rest away from him. The anxiety became the plug, the button that began to direct the affairs of his life. Because this man doesn't understand the technology of rest, he became a victim of the storm. People like Peter that understood the technology of rest, he could sleep in the midst of four quaternions of Sodom. You are not with me. If you, if you were with me, you will know that the reason why I said what I said is not so that you will laugh. Your laughter is proof that you are not with me. Because of that, I cut that syllable short. And then we'll... Uh, <laughs> if I notice you are not with me in any, any way, I will protest. I will protest by reducing the syllables. It was in the midst of four quaternions of soldiers. There were four soldiers that were presently with him, his fetters were connected to these four soldiers in this place. Just in case he gains some momentum and discomfits the four soldiers and he comes out of that cell, he will meet another set of four soldiers. 
and there are four sets of four soldiers that he will need. So, are you there? Have you, have you seen people before that must have courage, they came out of something and before they could finish testifying, they've, they've been silenced. It's, it's a satanic technology to ensure that your testimony will be short-lived. And that normally happens when you don't understand the technology of rest. The Bible says, with the stammering of the lips and with a new tongue, would I speak unto these people? For this is the rest that I will cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Exact, the exact words used in Exodus chapter 31, verse 7. Rest and what? Refreshing. You get it? What he was saying in the book of Isaiah is that your pathway to make your spirit rest is to stammer with your tongue. He's talking about speaking in tongues. If you speak in tongues and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter how hard the storm hits. There is a rest in the crucible of that fire that you will rest. The weary can rest there. And that's why Peter was able to sleep in the midst of four companions of sailors. He had done his time in stammering. Huh. Are you there? So I said there are 12 there are 12 platforms of the earth interacting with the heavens. And in the days of the fullness of the manifestation of the sons of God, these guys will have the capacity to use the resources that is domiciled in heaven by reason of the understanding of this technology and to bring the influence of the reign of God and the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. All right, let's start the lecture. I am convinced that you are here now. Hallelujah. When you go to the book of Genesis, you are going to find something. For those of you that were not here yesterday, I will need to do a recap, just a brief recap, so that you can understand the tangent from whence the Lord took us. We looked at the cherubim called Lucifer. How that Lucifer conceived a dream which was against the will of God. And he knew that the only way his dream will be accomplished was for him to set up another government that was apart from God. He, did. he says, I will ascend into heaven. And I was trying to explain why Lucifer had to ascend into the heavenlies. He had to ascend into the heavenlies because if he's able to establish this is government in the heavens, there will be a possibility that the influence of his government will hit the earth. And eventually in scripture, Jesus himself called Satan the God of this world. Meaning that Satan's vision to become an independent authority that will give instructions that will occasion his own will to come to pass upon the face of the earth became a possibility. The only way to understand and to interpret human life is from the perspective of the kingdoms from whence we function. The moment Satan was able to establish his kingdom in the second heavens, he found someone that believed he was bullied by God. Namely, Cain. And he began to sell his ideas to Cain, and Cain bought his ideas and in the same way that Cain, that Satan left the presence of God, left the government of God to establish his own counter-government, that was how Cain left the presence of God upon the face of the earth to establish a city and a civilization that will exist apart from God. Are you there?
By the time we move from Genesis chapter 6, to Genesis chapter 4, to Genesis chapter 6, we find out that there were already two races of men upon the face of the earth. You will know that, notice that Adam did not accompany Cain on that mission. Even though Adam was still alive when Cain left the presence of God. So there were still some individuals that refused to leave the presence of God. And they were hoping that one day God would come through the lattice and establish a means by which they could be restored. Right? So there were two separate races upon the face of the earth. By the time you go to the book of Genesis chapter 6, you will find out that the guys that left the presence of God began to multiply faster than the other guys that decided to separate themselves from this new move which was going to exist apart from God. We get it? Okay. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, we see a policy. We see a conception. God conceived a policy in himself. That's the first time that the Bible reveals the counsel of God. The counsel of God. Are you there? When God confers in himself, the Hebrew word that is normally used in such cases is Elohim. Elohim is the plural from God, for God. In fact, anytime you see in the Bible, him is plural. Cherub, cherubim, plural. The sons of Anak, Anakim, plural. So when you see Elohim, it's plural. It's the counsel of God. Are you there? When you hear, if you hear somebody prophesy, a prophet is prophesying. There are only three platforms you can be speaking for. If that voice is a voice that reveals the counsel that is captured in the kingdom of God. The first platform is the counsel of God. The things that have been conceived in the Godhead. You know me. Okay, let's, let's leave that. We can, if we don't touch that, it will not affect where we're going. My spirit is full and I'm looking for ways to bring us into an understanding. This Are you there? So when you hear stuff like, let us make man, that's a position, that's a policy in the council of God. Are you there? If I take you to the book of Ephesians and I show you the blueprint that God had in mind from eternity past, for which he sought implementation in time, you will see that maze of spiritual reality. It is the counsel of God. In that council, your calling was captured. In that council, the measure of anointing that you need to prosecute your calling was captured in that council. All the requirements that are necessary for you to be competent enough to deliver upon God's expectation for your life was captured. Are you there? So that's the platform of the council of God. The council of God is the council of the Elohim. It's unfortunate that I don't know about the United States, but in Africa, most of what we call prophetic is, is, is a charade. Because the prophets, most of the people that say they are prophets in Africa, they, they become very prophetic when there's a football match. They use the prophetic to predict football matches. May the Lord give you understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. So one of the platforms that prophecy should emanate from is from that council. If we hear what you are saying, we will know whether God has time 
to discuss this kind of matter. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Sometimes when you hear some utterances, you need to go and weep and pray for our generation. Because when they were saying those things, people were actually hailing them. That's how much of darkness we have to cope up with. Because men slept. The guardians slept. The keepers of doctrine slept. The keepers of nations slept. The keepers of cities slept. The keepers of territories slept. So enemies showed up. And what passes for doctrine in our time is child's play. Secondly, we have the council of angels. Because in the administrative infrastructure of the implementation of the policies of God, many angelic personalities are assigned to carry out various roles. Are you there? So, and part of the duties of a watchman is to watch to see and to understand the errands that angels are carrying. Because if you can understand the errands that angels are carrying in the city of Illinois, you will be able to deduce what the council that generated these errands was. So we have the council of God, we have the council of angels. Are you there? Don't have time to take you to the book of Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, then you see the council of angels. Then the third platform is the court of heaven. In the court of heaven, you have both God and angels and even some distinguished believers allowed into those courts to hear verdicts from the mouth of God and decrees from the mouth of God. Decrees that will shape nations, decrees that will shape cities. And it happens to be that Generation, only very few people are given the privilege to be part of those proceedings in the courts of heaven. When you read your Bible and you see that Satan visits heaven, calm down, don't be in a hurry. He doesn't visit heaven. He visits only the court of heaven because he's an accuser. He is a player in that system. Is that right? All right, so God came up with a conception and his conception was about a functionary called man. In the entire creative enterprise of God in the book of Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, you will see that every creature that was ever created was created after its kind. Mangoes, goats, cows were created after their kind. So if you want to teach a cow about being a cow, you show that little cow the big cow. The big cow is the best example of what a cow is. Unfortunately for man, we are the only creature that was not created after our kind. We are created after the God kind. And that has implications. I know you have not thought about it. The reason why you were designed like this is because you are supposed to be an agency that will partner with the heavens to implement divine policies that touch the earth. You were created in the image of God. You were created after the likeness of God. What's the meaning of that? When we say you were created in God's image, what does it mean? I believe that someone in this auditorium is a medical doctor. And if you are, can I can you notify us by way? So I believe. Does it take so much effort to get a medical doctor to okay? We have one. So there's no way you can do medical practice without putting on some gloves once in a while. So a glove, what is it? It's designed in the image of the hand. 
And the reason why it's designed the image of the hand because it will subsequently play host to a human hand. You were designed in the image of God. Because your ultimate operation will be determined by your capacity to contact God, to contain God, and to manifest God. Please help me preach to your neighbor. You were designed to contact God. You were designed to contain God. You were designed to manifest God. Now, I'm six foot two. Once upon a time, in the line of duty, by strange circumstances, I had to stay in a building that was not designed for someone my height. It was designed for people like five foot seven, but I was six foot two. And it had a ceiling fan. I, I know you don't know what a ceiling fan is. You know, the last time I checked, we were on minus eight. I, I, I say, Jesus, at this, what's going on here? So I know, I'm very well aware you don't know what a ceiling fan is. But a ceiling fan is a fan that is connected to the ceiling. Hallelujah. Once in a while, some of you need to visit the continent of Africa. It's a good place. You find things. You 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 see something called a generator, which I'm so convinced you don't know. Now, this ceiling fan was projecting from the ceiling. The height of this fan was somewhere here, and if I want to put on my clothes, I get injured. Do you understand that? Because the house was not designed for a man like me. Even though demons can possess people, the house is not designed for demons. Oh, I don't want to go into that. You were designed to be able to contact God. To contain God and to manifest God. Secondly, are you there? It is when he, he, he made it that way so that in order for you to be in his image and function accurately in his image, you need to be under his authority. So whenever you see image, just add authority. Whenever you see likeness, add representation. Right? So he wants you to function. That's the only way you can represent him is when you operate in his likeness. And so he was so merciful to give you a wife. But your task as a husband is to represent God in the life of that woman. And if you are doing just that, there will be evidences to show Are you there? If you want to contact God and contain God and manifest God, you must be confronted with the fact that you need to operate under God's authority. Whereas you have a powerful destiny, no doubt about that. But listen to me now. Whether or not God's eternal purpose for your life will be accomplished is dependent on whether he has the right of way to exercise his authority over your life. If God cannot exercise his authority over your life, God cannot fulfill his divine purpose in your life. We're talking about Heaven manifesting on earth the way the way heaven is in that raw native state for the manifestations of heaven to find expression of qualities of the earth. We cannot escape talking about alignment. If you are not aligned with the authority of God, even though He has a great plan for your life, it will never come to pass. 
the office that Jesus occupies in New Testament theology is the office of the Christ. The office of the Christ is an administrative office that is assigned with the responsibility to manipulate everything after the counsel of God's will. Such that at the end of the day, there'll be no loose end. Everything will be under his authority completely. If that thing has a place in the new estate that is building, then it must be under the authority of the Christ. Right now, are you there? Oh, you're not with me. Are you with me? So God created man in his own image. God created man after his own likeness and he was supposed to be a creature of dominion. He was supposed to have dominion over the elements. In fact, the scope of his dominion was captured in scripture. He was supposed to have dominion over aquatic reality. He was supposed to have dominion over terrestrial reality. Supposed to have dominion over atmospheric reality. Are you there? So everything from atmosphere to terrestrial to aquatic should not be able to exercise any form of disorder that is contrary to the authority we are ordained to walk in. Now, I think I need to visit you with a scripture quickly to give you an idea to define who man is before we start this job. I need to give you a working definition. Come with me quickly. To the book of Psalms. Chapter 82. Psalms 82. I want to give you a definition and then we can proceed. My scripture for tonight is in the book of Ezra. I pray we gather sufficient momentum, mileage to arrive at Ezra. There's a body in Ezra. It's a picture of the United States that, as I see it in the spirit. And I want to use the scriptures to interpret the signs I've seen in the spirit about the land and the seasons that are upon us and what we need to do to move the hand of God. Are you there? Okay. Verse 1 says, God standed in the congregation of the mighty. He judged amongst the gods. The second gods there is in small g, if you notice that. If we were all in Nigeria, which we are not, I will try to interpret what I want to say, but there's no English word for it. Please forgive me. Someone that is very learned will help me with the interpretation. If we were in Nigeria, someone would have thought that the gods there, connoted by a small g, is a deity called a Madioha. Please, somebody help me with that right now. Because <laughs> uh, for those of you that have not been to Nigeria, there's a deity. There's a deity that a lot of people worship in my country. And that name, that strange name I just called, is the name of the deity. So somebody from that environment will think that the gods spoken about there is with reference to deities and spirits that humankind consult for supernatural help. That's not true with the context of the scripture that I just read to you. I'm going to read other scriptures and uh, you will find out who these gods are. God's standard 
in the congregation of the mighty. And number two, are you with me? Okay, stay with me, stay with me. Number two, God does not stand. Doesn't. Doesn't need to stand. There are only two times in the Bible where it is written, God was standing in heaven. Only twice. And this is one of them. If you find the third one, you can confront me with it. Only two times. And the reason why God was standing was twofold. One, he was standing because he wanted to judge. In the day, in the court of heaven, when God wants to pass judgment, he was standing. So what we have here in the book of Psalms 82 is a court session. And I'd like you to read it with that perspective in mind as we journey. God's court is different from the court of the United States of America. Before someone is convicted in God's court, God will, God will take you for a lecture. And give you, it will school you effectively on the scope of your feeling, the scope of your error. Such that, are you there? The person will be speechless before judgment is passed. Come with me. You know why we are here? We are in the book of Psalms 82 because I need to define who man is from scripture. When we get the working definition, then I'll introduce Ezra chapter 1. And from Ezra, maybe we'll be able to understand when John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven. Is that All right. He said, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judged among the gods. This is the lecture now. How long will he judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? He's teaching the guys. Say, for how long will he judge unjustly? It means that these guys, are you there? These guys that were being educated had judicial powers. These guys that were being educated had authority. These guys that were being ed educated, they had power. They were enabled with power. They were enabled with authority. They were given the capacity to judge. He said, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? As we read on, you will find out that the entities he was referring to here are human beings. And the Bible calls them gods. And we are going to justify that the use of God. Meanwhile, to clear your doubts, the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 11 that if you call them gods unto whom the word of the Lord came and the scriptures cannot be broken. It was Jesus that said this one. Are you there? It was God the Father that told Moses that I've made you a God unto fair. It means that I've given you authority beyond the authority that drives the throne of fair. Are you there? So one of the evidences of the manifestation of the kingdom of God in the life of a man is divine authority. For instance, are you still here? Moses was the first king of Israel. I know you don't believe me. Since you don't believe me, let me show you from the Bible. I don't want to leave you in doubt. Now, so that we will not get lost in transit. Uh, someone will remind me. Of Psalms 
82. The reason why we are talking about Moses is because of the terminology, the God. Okay. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter... Thirty-three. Deuteronomy chapter thirty-three. If you have your Bible, turn. Okay. This my timer, the battery that is holding it, has uh, given up. So the preacher no longer has any anything to guide him. And if it happens that way. <laughs> It's, it will not, it will be terrible. So let's just, the way my spirit is full. Ah, Jesus. If you are still here, say amen. amen. All right, so this is, uh, are you there in Deuteronomy? Chapter 33. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Did you get that? Can you jump to verse 4? He was king in Jeshurun. And everyone here that is a Bible scholar knows that the nickname for Israel was Jeshurun. And the Bible says that Moses was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Stay with me, stay with me. The Bible says it was king in Jeshurun when? When is an adjective of time. Are you there? It means he was not operating in the kingly anointing every time. But whenever the elders of Israel and the elders of the tribes of the people were gathered, if Moses comes into their midst, Moses can access the anointing, the kingly anointing that was deposited in the heavens to govern Israel. You get that? Moses did not have any political throne as a king, but Moses walked in the kingly anointing and he gave decrees that became law. Imagine, are you following me? I know you know from verse 1 that we read that this is supposed to be the proceedings of a blessing ceremony. Because the Bible says that this is the blessing where with Moses blessed the children of Israel before his death. So this is a blessing ceremony. The moment the elders were gathered and Moses sat in their midst, that anointing was accessible to him. The first thing that he said under that kingly anointing was about the destiny of Reuben. He was not prophesying. He was decreeing. He said, let Reuben live. Meanwhile, the curse that was placed upon Reuben was placed upon Reuben by his father. And the implication of the curse was that all the males in the house of Reuben began to die strangely. And just before the tribe of Reuben became totally extinct, someone came under the influence of the kingly anointing and he said, let Reuben live. He was not prophesying about the future and said, in the future, no, he, he was decreeing like a king. So one of the evidences of the presence of the kingdom of God is the authority that we see manifesting in the lives of individuals. So Moses was given authority that was superior to the authority of the king of Egypt. It doesn't matter what decree Pharaoh makes. If Moses makes a counter decree, circumstances and situations will align with what he has said. And even Pharaoh will know that this man is operating on a throne, from a throne that is not a political throne. God standeth, the Bible says, in the congregation of the mighty. He judged among the gods. Then he began to bring education to these individuals. These individuals were given the anointing. These individuals were given the authority. These individuals were given power to take care of some of God's business. 
After he gave some authority, he planted them in families where witches operate. So that they will use that authority to end the activity of witches. And to bring everyone into obedience to Christ. Oh, my time is up. And I, I'm serious, my time is up. So we have just 29 minutes left. And that was possible because I lost sight of time. So I began to entertain digressions. He said, why will you judge unjustly and consider the persons of the wicked? It means these guys that were anointed to deliver people, they were anointed to set people free, they were anointed to do good upon the face of the earth and to extend the frontiers of the kingdom of God. What they did was that they decided to cooperate with the devil, to unite with the devil, to afflict the same people that they were sent to deliver. The anointing was so that they could defend the people that could not defend themselves. They could save the people that could not save themselves. That will influence people in such a way that the people could not be influenced. And through them, there will be an extension of the authority of God walking in the earth to ensure that the devil does not truncate the agenda of God that pertains to the lives of men. Instead of doing that, these guys now decided to join forces with the devil in the business of oppression. Because of that, they were summoned to headquarters. And that when they were summoned to headquarters, in that day, God was standing. Now, because if you follow the proceedings, are you there? In fact, God went as far as giving them an example. He gave them an example in the book of Psalms 82. Sorry, I will not be able to do my Ezra today. Maybe tomorrow. What I'm preaching now is not in my script. Meanwhile, I used, I spent time to design the orchestrate. The seven to deliver unto them. He gave them an example, the example of Adam and Eve. In, in verse 5, he said, They knew not. Neither will they understand. So Adam and Eve had a problem of lack of knowledge. They did not understand the scope of authority that God had vested upon them. They did not understand the, the scope, the the scope of influence that God has given them. They did not know that they were the key to the regulation of the entire visible realm. So when they rebelled against God, creation rebelled against them. So the Bible says that they know not, neither will they understand, they walk on in darkness. There was a darkness that was due them because of the way they deployed the authority that they had. If that was the end of that scripture, I would be very happy. The walk on in darkness didn't stop them. Say all the foundations of the earth are out of God. Go and research into the word foundations. All the foundations of the earth are out of God. I hope you know the Bible says that if the foundation be destroyed. So there are such among us that part of the authority God has given you was supposed to influence your entire family. But because you know not and because you did not understand, you began to walk under the deception of Satan's darkness. Satan made you blind and because of that, all those destinies you were supposed to influence are out. Of. 
Meanwhile, if God does not have a man to use, you see, he designed your, are you there? According to the book of John chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says that God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Meaning that it is your spirit that can contact God. And it is your spirit God can contact. If God wants to encounter you, God wants to reach out to you. There's an aspect of you that is designed to be able to operate on the frequency of God. And that's your spirit being. Are you there? So what God did was that he, he, he made you spirit, soul, and body. He, he did not just make you spirit. He made you spirit, soul, and body. Your soul is as important as your spirit. But I don't have time for that today. Jesus' definition of man is not spirit. Jesus said, Behold, I'm quoting from the book of Luke chapter 24, verse 39. He said, Behold my hands and my feet. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me. Are you there? Please help me test your neighbor. If you touch flesh and you touch bone, tell your neighbor you are not a spirit. If we don't understand the composition of man, it will be very difficult for you to understand how man is supposed to be a creature that extends its influence upon the face of the earth. Your spirit is part of your territory. Your soul is part of your territory. If you don't have a body, you can't even be here. Because it is possible for us to trivialize our body. It is very important for your mission. According to Jesus, we are not spirits. We are man. First Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning from verse 24, 25, you see Paul now saying that it's God's intention to sanctify us wholly, spirit, soul, and body. That's what man is. But it's your spirit that will contact God. Oh my God, you are not with me. When your spirit has contacted God, when your spirit has contained God, that's when you will discover that your soul is a major hindrance to the expression of what is in your spirit. Because you were living by your soul for so long, the soul is exercised. The soul has been in the gym. You were using it. You were using it. So it is oversized. Most of what you do becomes soulish. And your soul is like the husk. I don't know. Do you know rice? Do they plant, do they farm rice here? And stock. All right, so there's something called rice, all right? <laughs> when you harvest rice or wheat, it has this husk, this container that covers it. You will need to thresh it out before you get the real seed that we can eat. That's how your spirit is in relation to your soul. Your soul covers your spirit completely. So, so if God wants to deal with you, I will tell you how, what he does. You know, when you cast rice into the ground, soil water will soak that husk. Soil minerals will react 
with the horse and it will die and tear. It is through those cracks that the grains sprout from. The content of the spirit is in captivity because your soul is too bogus. We may never see the use of that spirit if God doesn't allow circumstances and situations that are beyond your comprehension to befall you. That's the reaction that is needed to break the authority of the soul so that the spirit can have an outlet of expression. So part of what your lot is, your portion is, requires that you go through some situations that will defeat your human wisdom. Because the heart of man is a factory that manufactures idols. Maybe your intelligence is your idol. You get by with your intelligence. And because of that, you believe that as long as you are alive, you will deliver. And then God now shows you how limited you are when you are on the hospital bed. The intelligence is still there, but it cannot help you in that situation. The reason why God allowed it, it's not God that brought the sickness, but he allowed, he saw it coming, and he became busy. Became busy so that it will catch up with you. Not for negative purposes. That's the only way the idol of self that has built its power high in your soul can be defeated. And if it's not defeated, you will never trust God. Oh, you are the only machinery he has to extend his influence upon the face of the earth. Are you there? A man that is still governed by his soul is like these guys that are standing in judgment before God right now. Because he will operate like a fallen man. You will, you will join Satan to oppress the people you were called to deliver. If someone that has not been dealt with, that his soul life has not been defeated by God, if you anoint that man, he will use the anointing to serve self. There is no profit that such a man can bring to God because the soul is obscuring the reality of his spirit. The soul has not been dealt with. The soul is still having all the ailments of the fall. It's still self-centered, still self-seeking. It's still about me. It's still about myself. It's still about I. Now, if you check your life, the way you live, why do you do what you do? 80% of what you do. When God begins to defeat that soul, you now have the capacity to now start becoming selfless. You now have the capacity to serve others. And you're not expecting anything in return. But if the soulish man comes and sells you, it's a deal. Yeah, you will pay back somehow. He doesn't sell for free. Are you, are you following me? When God defeats that soul, then you can stand before God in intercession and you can begin to love him. And then God begins to suck you into himself much more. That you start becoming comfortable with God's ideals and God's values and God's way of things and God's style. Your taste buds is adjusted and adjusted and adjusted until if God is not there, you are not satisfied. God accosted these guys. Verse 26, verse 6 of Psalms 82. This is the judgment now. He's, he's educated them sufficiently well. Now he wants to give them the judgment. God dealt with your spirit the day you gave your life to Christ and your spirit become, became regenerated because the Holy Spirit came to revive it so that it will live in it. Are you there? God will deal with your soul. Have you ever taken time to see the, the kinds of suffering Jesus suffered on the cross? There was a time on that cross that his father deserted him. 
in the history of God, that was the first time that was happening. The father and the son have been in perfect harmony, in oneness. But somehow, the father had to turn his back because his eyes were too holy to behold iniquity. And at that time, Jesus became sick. That was a suffering from his spirit because he was separated from his father. Do you, Passion of the Christ tried, attempted to depict it and show Jesus wearing panties. In the actual situation, he was naked. And that was shame. It was judgment on his soul. And I know you know how many times his body was pierced. In order for him to procure salvation, it was a trapper type man that underwent judgment. Because salvation is supposed to have a trapper type effect. Because man is spirit, soul, and body. If we limit the definition of man to spirit, someone that is born again would think God has perfected his work on his life. And he doesn't know that most of the skill that God needs to administer your development is in the maturing and of your soul life. Oh man. Sometimes when you lose your job, it's not because God could not keep it. He became an idol. You didn't know. So he cut it off. Sometimes when you lose some relatives, they were so nice to you, so nice to you, and the Lord knows that if they will stop you from going through the wilderness. He just says, I have a throne for you at home. Come to me, my dear one. And then you are exposed. You are under sunlight, intense cold, eight degrees, minus eight degrees, like I exposed. When you don't have anywhere to turn for a long time, then you begin to remember Sunday school. What they taught you when you were 12 years old. <laughs> oh, then you begin to learn how to pray. <laughs> My dad was an influential man. He was a good man. People used to visit when he was alive and then he just died. And everybody ran away. And I knew that the God he taught me about is the only one I have. I, I went in search of him. Are you there? With fasting and prayer and many tongues, loud. And I continued. He knew I was ready to die in the process. He didn't come for months, but I was there. Yes, he didn't come for months. He didn't even show up. He didn't, even, he didn't pretend as if he, he had any intention to show up because he wanted to test my resolve. If I had another God, I would stop. Most of you start fasting and praying. You say, I only have three days. Ah! You have another God. That's the reason why you stop. I didn't have anything to run to. It was only Jehovah. If he accepts, he comes. Because if he doesn't come, there is no way I can say. Yes. On the 264th day of my fast, he sent four angels to notify me of his coming. I saw the glory of these angels and the way they basked with light. Oh. And I stopped my search because the angels came. And because of the presence of the angels that followed me around, I started the miracle ministry. It was five years into the miracle ministry, it occurred to me that it wasn't angels I was going to meet. So I now started apologizing. Some of you escaped from the process. You were, were on cue. You were online. You were trying to make, and then something happened. The job came out, and they gave you a higher rank than you anticipated, and then you took off. So it means it was a job you were looking for. Some of you were in motion. You were, you were navigating. You were disturbing all of heaven. And God has set up a schedule for you. Because God meets people by appointments. You can't wake up and say, I'm going to visit President Biden. And you know what? I'm going to Washington. <laughs> you will not arrive there, I assure you. <laughs> he visits by appointment. When you become serious and you begin to search, with all your heart and seek with all your heart, then he schedules an appointment. I said, okay. If she can seek until this day, I will see her. Most of you, it, we were four days down the line 
to hit your encounter. When, when you just became busy. The business you were praying that it should, you, it, should, it should break out. It broke out and you left his presence in search of the business. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I, I realized that it was not angels I prayed to encounter. Meanwhile, the miracle ministry was there. I could see them. I could see them walking. I understand their language. I know how to minister and partner with them. And all kinds of things begin to happen. And if God is promoting me, he changes them. And then he, he begins to educate me about this one. This is how he works. This is how he works. I became excited. I became a preacher. People started knowing me. Oh my God. It took five years for me to leave. Then I did not pray Jesus anymore. I went back in search of Many of us ran off. When the job came, we took off. When the wife came, you zoomed off to honeymoon and you forgot that you were in the process. And when you came back from honeymoon, you didn't continue. You've been distracted by that wife and you've forgotten the transaction that you were doing. Some of you were in that journey and then attacks began to mount because you were in a community that was full of witches. So, in a bid for self-preservation, you say, if I continue this prayer, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to be tough for me. You decided to, to slack, to give respect to witches. When all they did was to intimidate you, you now began to fear the intimidation of witches much more than the power of God. So we have many Christians in the nation that are bringing no profit to the kingdom of God because they don't even know him. Meanwhile, they were designed to know him. The height of their existence was captured in the knowledge of him, as astronauts explore space, that's how we were designed to explore God. That's why there are places in Christ. Have you set your foot in that place where the power of God is hidden? Have you seen it? Have you seen in the spirit, in the place, the place where there is the dwelling of light? Have you seen that? Place? How far have you not? How far have you explored? The moment the apostolic anointing started coming upon me, I lost the patience. The patience required to counsel people. My greatest weakness is counseling. How do you do it? I believe that that time I'm using to talk to this individual, I can take one mountain for God. So one of those days I had to discipline myself to hear counsel. And what was the I was, I was dying. But I had to pray. A couple was married for seven years. And the wife never allowed the husband to explore her for seven years. I know somebody is shaking his head. That's how you are. You refuse to explore God all these years. 21 years in the faith. 12 years in the faith you have not explored. You don't know what happens when you go without food for seven days in search of God. You don't know what happens. You don't know what happens when you pray for 10 hours every day for 21 days. You don't know it. You never explore God. You don't know what happens. You don't know what happens. Meanwhile, when Apostle Paul gave his life to Christ, he went on honeymoon for three and a half years in the wilderness of Arabia. You didn't do that. The moment you give your life to Christ, they say, oh, welcome to the house. You didn't know you were supposed to go to Arabia. So we have Christians that don't know God, never encounter God. Meanwhile, by ordination, they have what it takes to transform their families, but their families are not yet transformed because they don't know God. When these guys, when the judgment of these guys started, in verse 6, he says, I have said, it was my original plan, I have said, ye are gods. Ye are authorities. Ye are supposed to be carriers of power. 
to change things on earth in my name. Oh, I remember in Zimbabwe. I was in the stadium preaching. That's the largest crowd I preached to at that time. About 25,000 people in the stadium and um, about 12,000 people outside. So crippled people began to rise. And then they told me that there are people outside. Please, let's go outside and minister. When we got outside, witches came together and they began to curse me. I asked my interpreter, what are they saying? Because they were, it was like a song. He refused to speak. I said, what are they? Then he said, all the causes, the vocabulary of causes that I've ever heard are in the lips of these women. They are causing me. You know why we are still here? The causes are, I'm waiting for them to come to pass. They don't have the authority to place a curse on a man that is in alignment with God. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, the demons in them, I cast them out that night. Yes, he didn't, it was not just that they spoke. Then I said, hey! No, I, I followed the, the spirit. I followed the spirit. I followed the spirit. He said, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you, this is man he is talking about. This is the father speaking. And he said, ye are authorities. Ye are minions of grace. Ye are my emissaries. Ye are my representation in the physical world. The physical world will, know, will, will only know me because they see me rise from within you. He are God. That's the first thing. Second thing he said, all of you are children of the Most High God. That means you will need to be in alignment with my authority in order for you to manifest my powers. You don't have powers in yourself. Just like the moon doesn't have light in itself. But the light it reflects is a light that he, it secures from the sun because of his alignment with the sun. At any point in time when you lose your alignment, you lose what you reflect. See, all of you are children of the Most High God. You are not like Lucifer that decided to be a standalone creature in a government that is contrary to God. You will burn with flames as long as you are in alignment with my government. Are you there? Then he said, but ye shall die like men. That's the judgment. Ye shall die like men. So, according to that judgment, mortality is not God's original plan for man. How many of you are aware of the fact that if Adam had eaten of the tree of life, he would have become an immortal being in the natural realm? Death wouldn't have had power. And that's why God sent a sword and a cherub to block the way to the garden of Eden so that Adam in his fallen state will not go back into the garden, sneak into the garden and eat of the tree of life and become an eternally damned fallen creature. I have said, yeah, God. That's how government comes into the earth. Oh my God. I have said all of you are children of the most high God. Tonight, we want to cry to God. The prayer is simple. Restore. Restore my horn. You know, David said, my horn shall thou exalt. Like the horn of a unicorn. Oh, some of you lost your horn. You lost your authority. There was a capacity that God was building in you. But that capacity never, has never manifested. Because you did not travel enough. You did not explore enough. Oh, restore my heart. You were becoming a prophet. Your eyes in the spirit was being opened. And when you pray, you see things. But you were excluded from that honor. Because you could not follow through. Restore my heart. You were becoming a voice in your territory. 
and your colleagues in the office. They were compelled to listen to you because the wisdom of God was upon your life. It was expected that your life will bring about the revolution and plant the name of Jesus within that context. But you began to lose your horn. Restore my horn. For my horn shall thou exalt. The psalmist says, like the horn of a unicorn, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Somebody cry to him right now. Oromosika, everyone is going to go back to that place from whence you strayed. There was a business you were doing with God. There was a business you were doing with God. There was a business, there was a business that you were doing with God. When you begin to exercise your spirit, the highways, the highways of God will begin to open up. Pathways in the spirit will begin to open up. The Bible says there is a path which no fowl knoweth, which the vulture's eyes have never seen. God will begin to cause you to see things that the fowls have not seen. To see things that the vultures have not been able to look upon. There was a journey that you were making with God. Restore my horn. Keriamosike. Brosketo mandeli mahasalaboria. Roma maseka dilo brosketo bandeli. Bosika braita kombe la mina seka bonde. Labro koseke talakunda bresko babalatalia. Indo se la briska talibo kento mi. Brai kombasuke babalento skele bandeli. Restore my horn. I used to prophesy. I used to be the intercessor of the street. I take the names of everyone that is born on that street and it becomes my project. I begin to consult heaven concerning each and every one of them. But I lost my touch in the spirit. I lost my ability in the spirit. There was an anointing upon my life. God moved over my spirit and planted his hand on my life. I could see into the realm of the spirit. I could tell the things that will come to pass. But I lost my eyes in the spirit. Restore my horn. Sela nombres. Oye la mama. Ela sanda le cobranda babo. Ese la mo kele. Ese la mo. Oye la mama. Shaile mena siga presco fe la mata ile. Oh. Bureskito mo kombre safalai tela. Brame soke lai kopiski. I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High God. Korea prisko fe la manteli mando. Endoro kosi kopre su velaite. Mando Korea Brasakule Badi. Eso Celia Tindo Combre Saka Bonda Zaminaide. Alabres Kobi La Conde La Zige Breske. Bereke Santuria Bramena Cure Batale. Iria Rarararaba Boscante. Ropena Sika Bresco Felaito. Exalt my horn, exalt my horn. Labro Cosesanate Cabria Sico. 
there must be an evidence of the authority of the Lord upon my life. There must be an evidence that I've been given capacity to bring changes, to bring changes to circumstances, to bring changes to situations. There must be an evidence. There must be an evidence. Morena si caprante curia. Rata cose mania cambre scofe la binanze. Era taba bonda sabina e cobre scofe la toa. Era baba bo sama si caprenda. Call upon his name. Call upon his name. Forget about your neighbor. Forget about the person that is sitting by your side. We will rise in your name. Adonai, you reign on high. We will rise in your name. Adonai, you reign on high. 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 In your name, I don't know. Call upon his name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So I beheld in the spirit and I saw someone in this congregation. You were called into the office of the prophet. I see the regalia that you were supposed to wear. 
that will open your eyes in the spirit. Right now, the Lord is giving you that regalia. In the next 17 seconds, the hand of God will come upon you. It will come upon you. The hand of God will come upon you. There's a reactivation, a reactivation, a reactivation. Holy Ghost! Ushers, is it possible for me to touch that person? Listen to me. There is an anointing that when it comes upon you, you will have the ability to see into the realm of the spirit. There are two people in this place that will receive that anointing. In the next 17 seconds, there are two people. Two people in the auditorium. 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 Two people, two people, two people. Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. Listen to me. Oh my God. If you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, can we pray in tongues in one minute? In one minute. In one minute. In one minute. In one minute. So say like hombre scufetami. Le hombre scufet la miso sana hantalia. Le hombre scontela y scopre manito hombre baba suketale. I alaba bosetoria brisco fe la bise natale baronde. I cabras que toro oro casqueso sanila brandemo. Brai casama brai cabarato sketo bendami. Geminae compresco falabunda. I cabrema monseque galibo satoria. Hey God, God, baroco si compresco. Baroco mancela ide. Baroco Simon Zaliato, e broschetto kendo robo santalia, che la bon seke, che la bon samina. That which you lost, you can begin to receive it back. That which you lost, brisco fe la bonde, si compresco fe la handelia. Rabba sonte pre, geminai comprasque tobi la canzeli. Oh, that which you lost, he wants to restore, he wants to restore. This is the moment. This is the moment. Make sure you are hooked up. Let's so say la brisco fe la mandeli. El alo brisco fe la manjali. Esco brege de la subri ala babo senali. Onde lo brosqueto bondo corobo santa. Ah, eco premina si la bonde. Ala brosqueto mina santa baboria. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God wants to increase the rank of seven intercessors. He wants to increase the rank of seven intercessors. In the next 17 seconds. From my left hand side. To my right hand side. To the back of the hall. Oh, Father. These seven intercessors that you want to upgrade, let your hand come upon them. 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 Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Move. Let the hand of God, let the glory of God, this, oh my God, I see two cloven tongues of fire descending from heaven, descending from heaven. There are two evangelists in this auditorium, fiery evangelists, and the fire 
it comes upon you under fire. It comes upon you under fire. It comes upon you. We were in your name. Oh, if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, exercise your spirit. 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 Because a little one shall become a thousand. A small one shall become a strong nation. Exercise your spirit. Thank you. 